as always, I want to start with some announcements. Um, there's a homework that's available on Canvas. It's due next Tuesday. Uh, it involves building decision trees. Uh, technically speaking, after Thursday's lecture, you should have most of the content you need for doing the homework. Uh, and today we'll be done with it. Uh, we'll, we'll be done with decision trees. Are there any questions? Have people started? Yes, so there are questions. Oh no, you just started. Okay. Are there questions? Yes. Just to confirm, question two wasn't doable until today's content, right? Which one is that? Which one's question two? Building the, yeah. the coding so, part. Does it deal with no values? Which one's question two again? The This is the experiment, right? Hey, what, what, can you elaborate on that? Where does it deal with null values? I used to be when I was looking at some of the data, I know there was some null values. Okay. And I thought, that's strange. And I looked at today's lecture. And it okay, was so you, you yeah, it, 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 there's a little bit of question too that may not be doable, but uh, essentially the code will not change too much. So uh, a bunch of it will be doable, would have been uh, doable. And the scaffolding of your code essentially is going to be the same. You know, your choices for how to represent a tree and how to... Uh, you know, the recursive call and all those things. Essentially, the only thing that might change is some pre processing. Yep. Yep. Um, possible values that you can Um, I don't like, are, are you asking for a number or uh, like a like a range? It should be positive. Okay, thank you. It should be positive. There's that. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? If you haven't started the homework, I strongly, strongly encourage you to start as soon as possible because uh, uh, this is the first homework of the semester and there's usually some sort of uh, glitches that you'll have to deal with involving non-machine learning things like how do I connect to the CAD machines or my code works on my laptop but not on the CAD machines. There's what, what libraries are available there or uh, getting your environment set up how do I read a CSV file and load it into something? You know, these sorts of uh, non-machine learning, non-learning algorithm stuff, non-experiment uh, things kind of uh, become really, uh, they invariably show up. So I encourage you to start soon. Anytime you invest in that, uh, will uh, you know, in addressing those issues, um, is not wasted because all the subsequent homeworks will use essentially the same environment. Um, over the course of the semester, through your homeworks, you'll be building the beginnings of a machine learning library. So you'll be implementing a whole bunch of learning algorithms. So just keep that in mind as you write your code so that you can use that for, uh, you can maybe use certain parts for future homeworks also. Um, yes. No question. I noticed that the submission requires a shell file. Is there any? Oh, right. Uh, so we'll put together something on, on Canvas uh, uh, as a, a tutorial on the run script. I think there is something in the FAQ section of the class website already. Uh, if there isn't, uh, even if there is, we'll post something on Canvas on like a on a structure of the file that you might uh, have. So we can what did you want to say something? Oh, I'll just post it. Okay. He already posted something. No, just he will, I'll just post it very soon. Okay. Um, and do take advantage of office hours. Uh, we are available every day of the week. Um, come to office hours one way or another uh, because yeah, it's if you're stuck, it, maybe it's something that we can resolve quickly. Yes. Do we have to use the latex? You don't have to use latex. Uh, I personally would use LaTeX, uh, but that's just me. Uh, you don't have to use it. Uh, we do need a PDF. That, uh, you can use Word or... Sure, you can use Word. Uh, I'm not fond of writing maths in Word. In this homework, there's not a lot of maths to write, but in a subsequent homework, you'll be proving theorems. And uh, if you're comfortable with that, I think there was a suggestion of a, of a math um, a plugin for Google Docs. Uh, whatever works. I don't really care. Don't take a photograph of something that's handwritten. <laughs> um, submit a PDF of some machine written math, right? Machine uh, drawn math. Yes. Do we need to write the details of the math? 
or just the other one? Uh, you will. If I need to uh, give the information again, should I only write the answer? Or if you write only the answer, we will not, uh, and if the answer is wrong, we can't give you any partial credit. So give us enough information to convince us of two things that you actually worked to get the answer. And second, that uh, in case your answer is wrong, we will be able to look at the steps and give you some partial credit if necessary. Uh, first you, then you. Yeah. Are you partial candidate documents if they're readable in PDF form? Uh, I'm looking at my TAs because they're the ones who are going to grade it. I'm not. I prefer not. Partly because uh, uh, readable is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and I'm not... Uh, I, I usually tell this to all my students. Mm -hmm. I... I don't trust my own handwriting to be legible to anyone, and I expect nothing from anyone else. <laughs> so I can read my handwriting; it's amazing. But you know, the, apparently, I'm the only one who thinks that. So I, I would strongly, strongly encourage uh, uh, typeset results. I'll go to him and then you. Yeah. Um, if we just like take you to a template and get our answers out of the question, that's totally fine. There's a ten-page limit that we have. Uh, that was instituted. Partly because maybe five or six years ago, there were some students who wrote like 20, 25 pages for each homework. And that got really hard for us to grade. So, you know, you can use the same template, just remove all the explanations and everything. Just you can use that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, it's usually on the video. Uh, you mean the annotated slides? So the slides are essentially the same, except stuff I write. Is that um, I don't post them. I have never done that. But you can go to the uh, the video uh, of the class and find the place. Would that be sufficient, or do you want me to post the slides with annotations? Okay. Yeah, I will. Uh, th that's a good suggestion. I'll do that. Yeah. I was just going to add, uh, use LaTeX for math, but if you're like drawing a tree or something, you don't oh. want to just snap a picture of that, you can do that. Yeah, yes. Uh, if you're drawing trees and stuff, uh, if you can snap a picture, that's fine. Um, yeah, but using LaTeX to draw trees is, is it's fun um, if you have a lot of time. Yes. Uh, yes, I think uh, it, it does that show up in the preamble. Uh, the first, uh, it doesn't. Does it not show up in the preamble? I don't know. Does, okay, uh, if it does not, then it's it's not there. I thought I added it. Must maybe I took it off in some version. So uh, if the preamble does not say that, then there's no limit. But please just keep, you know, let's uh, let's be fair here to the TAs. <laughs> Uh, they have to grade it, and uh, let's not uh, make their lives much harder than it needs to be. If it's not there, then I think it should show up in the next homework. Uh, usually what I have is uh, there's a 10 page limit, but you can buy extra pages at one point each. Uh, so you can, you can write 100 pages. You won't get anything. All right. Um, Oh, yeah. Uh, and there were some questions about uh, project. There's like, uh, uh, there, there will be some updates to the date for the project milestones. Uh, I'll talk about it uh, uh, in the next lecture. Any other questions? Any questions on Zoom? Okay. All right. So if there's nothing else. Let's go back to where we were. We were talking about decision trees. And uh, in the last lecture, uh, I introduced this algorithm called ID3, which is uh, a basic decision tree learning algorithm. I'm going to quickly just summarize this algorithm and pick up where we left off. Uh, it's a rather simple algorithm. It takes a data set and a set of set of features here they are called attributes uh, that are currently in consideration. And if the data set contains examples that have that all of which have the same label, then you don't need to build a decision tree to predict the label because all the examples have the same label. So you just create a node with that label. Otherwise, you have a bunch of features and you choose the best one um, and put that at the root of the tree and different values that the feature takes. So you choose the best feature and different values that the feature takes form uh, edges going out of that node. And let's say this is uh, 
this feature takes four values, A, B, C, and D. And in each case, what you're left with is a subset of the data. So the when the best feature takes the value A, you have a subset of examples where that condition holds. So now you have a data, data set, and you need to build a tree below that node such that, uh, with the data that you have using any of the features except the best one. So what you do is a recursive call for the subset of the data. Here it's called S sub B using all the other features. And then you just attach it there. And you do that for each uh, part and you're done. So uh, this is a rather simple recursive algorithm. There are a few base cases to worry about, but essentially the idea is um, if the data is perfectly um, uh, Aligned with one label, just create a leaf node with that label. Otherwise, partition the data according to the best feature, and for each partition, make a recursive call. Any questions about the mechanics of this algorithm? For each subset, the next feature could be different. So just to clarify, the choice of the best feature, let me use a different color here, and the choice of the next feature here might be different because you're working with different subset of data and the recursive call for the, the subtree under A and the recursive call for the subtree under B don't know about each other's existence. So they make different choices. That's a good point, actually. In fact, uh, that's a common a mistake I've noticed with people who uh, didn't fully get the algorithm. They make this, they call the recursive algorithm once for A and then use the same feature everywhere. But no, you need to call, uh, make a recursive call for each one of these things separately. Other questions? Yes. Is it possible to uh, implement this algorithm uh, without recursion? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, a, any sort of a recursive algorithm, you can implement it. Then you'll have to keep your own uh, cues and stuff. And yeah, yeah. sure, you can do it, but uh, why? You can. Um, you know, if you want an interesting programming exercise, go for it. Um, I would, for your homework, I would encourage you not to. It's much easier to do it this way. And you know, in general, uh, I think anytime you have a tree data structure, it's natural to think recursion. You can, of course, implement it uh, without recursion, but. Okay, so this is a, a basic algorithm. There's a question on uh, Zoom. If you start with the feature with the high with the highest information gain, should the next level of the tree be the feature with the next highest information gain? That's an interesting question. So let me uh, uh, let me create a new page for that because so let's say that I have chosen a feature. Let's call that uh, you know let let's say that I have a data set here. And based on this, I choose the feature best. And this feature has the highest information gain. But it's not just this feature, right? I have, let's, let me name these features uh, F1. So I have three features, F1, F2, and F3. F1 has, let's say, an information gain of 0.8. F2 has an information gain of 0.7 and 0.6. So F1 is, of course, the best feature to uh, pick. Let's say F1 is uh, binary, so you split on plus and minus. And now you have a subset of the data. Some of these examples here end up here, and some of these examples here end up on this side. Now, the question, if I understand correctly, is, is it necessary that now that we have used up F1, is it necessary that on the plus side, or the minus side, F2 has to be the next best feature? Well, the answer is not really, because once you're done with the top node, all of these things are done. You toss the whole, this whole computation out, and then you recompute the information gain for F2 and F3 here separately, F2 and F3 here separately. It's possible that maybe the information gain here for F2 is 0.1, and here it is 0.4. And maybe here it is 0.9, and here it is, say, something else, 0.1. So it's entirely possible 
that uh, and just to come take this to completion in this case here you will choose f3 and here you'll choose f2 and you'll build the tree further so it's entirely possible that uh, the once you kind of go down a level the next best feature need not have the highest second highest information gain at the top level does that answer your question ryan while okay cool awesome other questions Yes. But uh, even if you can get, say, if you know, I have 10 sets of data and the first five goes to the plus side of it one and the uh, next five goes to the minus side. But now among this five, only the average will change uh, the uh, split in F2 and F3 now. So we recalculate the entropy. That's what you're saying. You recalculate the entropy, you recalculate the average entropy, every component of the information gates gain gets recalculated. Okay. And since we're talking about information gain, might as well just get into a little bit more detail. Uh, we saw this in the last lecture also. The goal of uh, the ID3 algorithm is to... Dis oh, yeah, there's a question. Um, I was wondering, why does it matter on the second row which one is picked first? Like, does it matter that F3 is on the Left side and that's who's on the right. No, I just put it that way. I mean, I I just wanted to create an example where the same thing is not chosen in both places. Yeah, I was thinking about why does it matter as well. So I just pick the uh, so basically I just pick the second highest. So I pick for zero seven. So but then I you don't I, pick the second highest. You never pick the second highest. Uh, you said you pick the second highest where. On the second level. You don't. Partly because the 0.7 for F2, the information gain of 0.7 for F2 was determined by considering, let me zoom in here, was determined by considering all of these examples. Yes. So the... Whereas what we really care about is the information gain for these examples. And on this side, we care about the information gain for these examples. So it's possible that Together, in in a certain, some sort of a aggregate or an average sense, F2 is the second best. But maybe in this partition, F2 is really bad. Maybe F2 is really good on this partition. And that is where, this is why we get the 0.7 here. Right? So it's possible that F2 is really good on some partition of the data. And that's why the aggregate is good. But when you split according to F1, you get, maybe this entire data set does not need another split at all. Maybe it has, the, it's, completely uh, the label is just there it's all the same label so what's the point of picking a second uh, feature again does that uh, was that also your question yeah okay so in a case when we don't get information gain for example if f2 and f3 are both point one uh -huh. we would we decide let's just not split oh so the question is let's say that uh, in both both f2 and f3 have the same information gain or let's say that the top there are two or three features that have the same information gain at the top. Which one do you pick? At that point, the answer is, uh, there's a little bit of non-determinism. You can pick a feature randomly. They are all equally good. You split on whichever one. If you want to make your code completely deterministic, you have a certain ordering of the features and you pick the first ones. There is nothing according to the information gain criterion that can distinguish these features. So we just stop doing splitting if we do not gain any more. No, 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 no. You don't stop splitting. Let's say that here you have F2 and F3 both have 0.1. Mm -hmm. Then you pick one of them and split. Okay. The only base case is here. You stop splitting uh, in the case where you have to, where all the examples have the same label. That's the only base case. Okay. So in other case, yeah, basically that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we saw in the last uh, lecture was uh, the intuition for this information gain heuristic. Um, the information gain heuristic was designed to, and to kind of make the trees that are generated smaller. And uh, there's a related question. Is it possible that two features could have the same information gain? It's entirely possible. Here's an example. Let's say you have two copies of the same feature in the data set by some mistake, by some accident, someone copied a column in the data set and you get the same feature twice. No matter how you split the data, those two features will have the same information gain and you pick one of them randomly. So 
The intuition for ID tree is uh, that you try to make the tree smaller uh, um, if possible. Finding the smallest tree that's co consistent with the data set is an intractable problem from a computational perspective. So we don't try to solve that. Instead, we uh, ID tree is a greedy heuristic that just keeps building a tree down. It never, after taking a step down, it never goes back and says, you know what, now maybe I should have changed the decision. So it, there's no backtracking. Um, and the intuition gain heuristic, we saw this in the last lecture. There is There are two components here. There is the entropy of the data. Entropy is just another way of saying the amount of disorder or uncertainty or ambiguity in the data. In this specific case, it's ambiguity about the label. So how much uncertainty is there about the label? So it's the entropy of the data minus for uh, the average entropy of all the subset of the data partitioned according to this feature A. And uh, uh, th th this average is weighted by the fraction of examples that belong to that label. And so this is kind of a little complicated. It may seem a little uh, ugly. And that's why in the last lecture, we started working through this tennis example. And the tennis example is, uh, uh, this was the example that we had. I'm not going to go through the, the, the numerical part again, because uh, frankly, that's a little boring. And I think it's better if you just work through it offline. But essentially, what you do is you go one feature at a time. And for each one of them, you calculate the information gain according to the criterion that we have and pick the one that has the highest information gain. In this example, we found that Outlook had the highest information gain. So we created a decision tree or the beginning of a decision tree whose root node is Outlook. Outlook can take three values, sunny, overcast, and rain. And uh, this is where we basically uh, uh, left off at the end of uh, last lecture. So we have three values, sunny, overcast, and rain. And when I partition the data, if I filter only to sunny, you get these, this, these two rows, these two, and this one. So you have one, two, row one, two, eight, nine, and 11. If I filter according to overcast, you get four rows. And for rain, you get five rows. And right away, even without thinking too hard about what should happen next, let's focus on this subset of the data, which is which corresponds to row three, seven, twelve, and thirteen. And we see that all the examples there have the same label. The plus plus is just an, uh, a shorthand for saying yes, yes in this game. Remember, the, the story here is that uh, we are using this decision tree to decide whether I should play tennis or not. So all the examples in this partition have the label plus. So we don't need to build another tree. We can just say the label say yes. If overcast, if the outlook is overcast, then the decision is yes. That leaves us with these other two rows to worry about. And uh, now we can continue. Uh, building the decision tree on those two sides. So for this, uh, uh, for the this side, for the case where the uh, the feature, the outlook feature takes the value sunny, we are left with five uh, examples, two of which are plus and three of them are minus. And so that corresponds to um, this subset of the data. You have five examples. And your goal now is to use any feature except outlook because outlook is no longer uh, uh, able to discriminate between the pluses and the minuses on that, that subset. You can use any feature except Outlook to build a tree to decide whether you should play tennis or not. So we need an algorithm that can use a, sub, a data set, in this case, these five examples, to build a decision tree. Luckily, we have that algorithm. It's the same algorithm. It's ID3. So we make a recursive call and we create a tree and stick it here. And we do the same thing on the other side. So for you know we have this subset of the data, and we go through the same process again. For each of the remaining features, temperature, humidity, and wind, we compute an information gain. This time, we use only this subset of the data to compute the information gain. This is all the data we have. Then once we are inside this recursive call, and each of them has some value, it turns out in this case, the humidity uh, feature has the highest information gain. So you split on humidity. What that means is when I say you split on humidity, that means you create a node here 
with value of uh, who, that tests for humidity and it takes two values high and normal and if you work through this you'll find that in each of these cases let's actually work through this when humidity is high plate ns is always no when humidity is normal plate ns is yes we don't we are we come to the base case so all the all the subsets in each of these cases have the same label so we can just put the label there any questions ID3 is a learning algorithm. Decision tree is the hypothesis space. Decision tree is the classifier that the learning algorithm produces. ID3 is just the name for the name of the algorithm. There are other learning algorithms for decision trees. Other questions? At this point, hopefully it's getting boring enough that you are you, you can see what's going to come next, right? Well, what comes next is uh, you you look at all the examples that have uh, the, the, where outlook is rain, so these examples, and then you compute the information gain for all the remaining features, and you pick the highest one, and it turns out it's wind, and when you split on wind, you get uh, for when wind is strong, the label is no, when wind is weak, the label is yes. At this point, we've hit the base case for every branch here. We no longer have subsets of examples, right? We no longer have any recursive calls. We're done with the decision tree learner. Questions? Yes. So we find out money completely According to this particular criteria, it just so happens that according to this criterion, temperature is unrelated. However, had I Without thinking about the the I the the what do you call this the entropy based information grain criterion, suppose I had decided to just split on temperature at the top. I could have done that. I could have built a tree where the root is temperature, and then it may seem like temperature is relevant. It just so happens that according to this criterion, it seems like the decision tree, we can construct a decision tree that perfectly agrees with the data set without using the temperature feature. Notice how many caveats I'm talking in there. This algorithm that perfectly agrees with this data, maybe a different criterion, maybe a different data set, and you might find a different uh, result. Yes. It seems that trees are a hypothesis space, right? That's right. The reason that we have to come to hypothesis spaces is because we originally said that if we're trying to predict some sort of data function, looking at all the possible data, doesn't really make sense because the amount of function is something like that. So, despite that, you'll said later on that decision trees can actually map to any possible mm -hmm. function. Right. So, what's the point of decision? Tree? Excellent question. So, let me repeat the question uh, uh, for those of you who didn't mm -hmm. hear it. One of the lectures earlier, I said um, if you search over the space of all possible Boolean functions, mm -hmm then learning is going to be impossible, could be impossible because the number of functions is too large. And then I said, the only way to get around that is to restrict your search space and not search over the space of all possible Boolean functions. And then I introduced decision trees and said, here's the hypothesis space. And look, it can it represents all possible Boolean functions. So what's going on here? I said, don't search over all possible Boolean functions. And literally the next lecture, I'm like, let's search over all Boolean functions. Two things. First of all, this particular algorithm, ID3, does not search over all possible Boolean functions. In fact, it's greedy. It has a certain uh, bias towards smaller decision trees, only functions that are represented by smaller decision trees. But in the limit, it can actually predict any Boolean function. So we are still in the we've, we've still not escaped the problem. The other, the more the more uh, important point here is. It is entirely possible that decision trees, because it can represent any Boolean function, is actually a bad hypothesis. And what we will do is we will not search over all possible decision trees. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about very soon is maybe letting a tree grow all the way down to the leaves is not a good thing. And maybe it's good to have a limit to the depth that you can reach. And your homework has that. You, li you limit the depth of the tree. Maybe if I limit the depth of this tree, 
to be, it can have only one node. Then I cut the tree off there and I force a decision. Here there are three minuses. So in this case, it should be a minus. Here there's all plus. In this case, it's a plus. Here it's two pluses, it's a plus. I force a decision there and I live with the error on these examples and these examples because uh, you know I've truncated the tree. I can do that. And by that, I'm restricting the set of functions. So the way to restrict the set of functions expressed by decision trees is not let them grow as deep as they need to fit all the data. We'll talk about this more in a bit. So um, quickly summarizing the learning algorithm, we have uh, uh, the goal of decision tree learning is to search over the space of all possible decision trees, which as I just said, can represent all Boolean functions. And this is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, our goal is to find the best decision tree. And here, the word best is dictated by the choice that we use to find the, uh, the feature to split on at the root of the tree. The ID3 algorithm is a greedy heuristic um, because finding the smallest possible decision tree that is perfectly consistent with all the data is intractable. As the data gets bigger, the computational complexity gets uh, much worse, exponentially worse. This is a batch algorithm. What that means is it for training, namely to build a decision tree, it uses all the data that's available to make the choices. So that takes us to the end of the part on learning decision trees. We've looked at what decision trees are, and we've looked at perhaps the simplest decision tree learning algorithm, which, uh, you know, if I have to summarize it in three steps, if all examples have the same label, create a leaf with that label, Otherwise, find the best node, the, mo the, the best feature, the most informative feature, and split the data into, uh, into various uh, parts, into partitions where that feature has different values, and uh, just recurse. Are there questions? And there's a question on Zoom. Can there, be, uh, can there possibly be more training instances such that there would also be a subtree with root humidity beneath... Uh, Okay, I think this is specific to this tree here. Can there be more training instances such that there could be a subtree with the root as humidity uh, below this particular thing? So below this uh, case, notice that here we've not used the humidity uh, feature at all. And if you have more examples, maybe those examples will need that feature to kind of make the partition. It's entirely possible. You're right. Other questions about the learning algorithm? Yeah. Um, so if you do like a regression algorithm, mm -hmm. right, and you get um, some sort of transformation matrix, then you can evaluate that to see how well, um, like, to see if you have enough information to actually estimate all the things you're trying to estimate. Are there similar ways to evaluate these trees? Unfortunately, not. Unfortunately, you can't tell whether you have enough data to, to make the predictor generalize. The, the, there are attempts, and we will actually be trying to make some uh, give some formal answers to that question uh, when we talk about computational learning theory. But typically, they also make assumptions that may or may not be reasonable. <coughs> yes. Um, we have learned the, the, uh, the distributed machine learning algorithm. Yes. And in any machine learning algorithms, how do we know that it's optimal? I mean, is there any formal proof, or do we need to test it on data sets to know? The worst case. So the question is: Is is there any guarantee that that the learning algorithm is optimal according to some criteria? Um, worst case, no. Worst because uh, if you give me a learning algorithm. And I'm not, we won't go into too much detail on this specific point. If you give me a learning algorithm and you claim this is the best algorithm in the world, uh, there are theorems that show that I can construct a data set that make your algorithm fail. Uh, the, the, this is a very loose characterization of a set of theorems called the no free lunch theorems. There's no free lunch. Okay, so we talked about this. Now we're going to have a little bit of discussion about some extensions of this basic uh, framework of decision trees and uh, um, we will uh, look at a technical problem that 
we, we look at it from the length of decision trees, but in generally it shows up across, uh, it's an important point across all of machine learning, namely the problem of overfitting. So we, we are in this extensions uh, uh, subsection of this unit. Uh, we'll be looking at some variants of this information gain criterion. Uh, we'll uh, look at this uh, question of what to do if your data does not have a value for a certain feature. Um, we'll quickly revisit what to do when your features are not Boolean. We've already seen that because the outlook had three values. It was not Boolean and uh, we'll just revisit this. And hopefully we'll spend most of the time talking about this problem of overfitting. So we looked at information gain. The information gain criterion in the original ID3 algorithm was defined using this concept of entropy. Um, entropy measures the disorder or impurity or ambiguity or uncertainty in the labels. It turns out that uh, entropy is not the only way to measure disorder. And there are other, uh, other uh, uh, criteria. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about two of them. The, something called the majority error and the Gini index. I have never known whether it's Gini or Gini, and I call it Gini. Um, so the, the majority error is a criterion that says the following. Suppose you were forced to stop growing the tree below a certain level. So let's say we have a tree. And we are sitting here right now. Suppose that, uh, and there's like a bunch of examples there. And Suppose you have to make a decision here on the examples that are there for what the label should be. You're not allowed to grow the tree further. Let's say there are um, 10 examples and nine of them are plus, one of them is minus. What label would you pick if you are forced to pick a label? Plus. Plus. plus right? And what would your error be? You have nine pluses and one minus. 10%, 10% right? That's it. That's the majority error. If you pick the most common label, so you choose plus there, so some of you said plus, and the reason for that choice is it's the most common label. So you have nine pluses, one minus, the most common label is a plus. And if you choose a plus, you make error, you, 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 your tree will make an error on that one example that has a minus. The majority error is if your uh, tree was grown uh, uh, with the majority label, what would the error be? So the example here, you have 15 pluses and five minuses. What would the majority error be? What would the majority error be? 25. Why? So some say 25, some say 25. I maybe raise your hands and I'll call out. Nobody wants to raise their hand. Yes. I think 25% because the label of 20 basis plus and five out of 20 other things would be incorrect. That's right. So the majority label here is a plus. So if you're forced to stop growing a tree, the most reasonable choice to do to make that is to pick the label plus. But by doing that, you lose out on five of those examples. So you lose you get your error is one fourth. It turns out this simple property behaves very much like the entropy. Higher majority. The, the, so if you think of uh, 10 pluses and 10 minuses, then the majority error is 50%. If you have 10 pluses and zero minuses, the majority error is zero. So it's when there is more uncertainty about the label, the majority error is higher. When there is less uncertainty, the majority error is lower. The Gini index also behaves that way. So I can plot all of these three functions. Imagine that you have uh, only two uh, possible values here, plus and minus. Let's say P is the fraction of positive examples, then one minus P is a fraction of negative examples. So I can plot here where this axis is P and this axis here is uh, whatever measure of impurity we have. Gini index, majority error, or entropy, or whatever. All of them kind of have this sort of a concave shape. They peak in the middle and they are zero at the edges. They have the same shape, basically. It turns, which means that, uh, just to kind of uh, 
make this more concrete. When the uncertainty is the highest, what's the what's special about this middle? This point five. Point when p equals point five, that says exactly half the examples are plus, exactly half the examples are minus. When a random new example comes in, it's maximum. You you'll be maximally uncertain whether you put it in a plus or a minus, because half of them are plus, half of them are minus, and that's where all of these measures attain their highest value. Entropy gets the value of one. The other two things get a value of uh, half. At the other extreme, the uncertainty is lowest when all the examples are plus, in which case p equals one, or when all the examples are minus, in which case p equals zero. In both cases, if all the examples are plus, a random new example is tossed at you, you don't need to look at the example. You know it's a plus. If all the examples are a minus, so that 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 would be this situation here. If all the examples are a minus, you know that a random new example will also probably be a minus. So in both cases, the label is known with certainty. Alternate, you know, in other words, the uncertainty is the lowest. These measures, all of these things, measure the amount of disorder or impurity in the labels that you have. And it's a reasonable thing to say that all of them have a value zero. Any questions about these, these three different uh, criteria? Yeah. So it looks so similar. In the case of labels with only yes or no, uh -huh. is there literally any reason to use one over the other? So there, there are some choices, some cases where uh, uh, you know they, they make slightly different uh, choices. The ordering is the same, but the gap between these two, um, you know, let me just uh, clear out and go to. Uh, so consider point two and maybe point three here. The gap between point two and point three is this much here. Let me zoom in. For the majority error, this is the gap, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas for the Gini index, the gap is this much, which is slightly different. And for the other mm -hmm. entropy, the gap is much higher. So it's possible that it, it might make different choices. Um, in these middle ranges. And now if you ask me a priori or upfront, can you tell me which of these is the best? The answer is I can't. Uh, and in your homework, I think I ask you to try out. No, I don't. But in your homework, you can actually easily play with these different variants uh, and uh, get a sense of which ones, whether they make different decisions. It's possible to construct data sets where they will make different decisions. So you're saying that if we had the same data set, put them through each of these different mm -hmm. measurements, you could get a different ordering of all yes, right. information. That's right. You could. Doesn't necessarily mean that one of them is worse than the other. They just make different commitments. Remember, the ID3 algorithm is a heuristic that's dictated by the choice of the entropy measure. So these are three different heuristics. Really. It's just that when I look at the graph, what I see is if I look from zero to zero point five, mm -hmm. for literally all of the functions, any point to the left is strictly less than the point on the right. Right. To so me, it looks like it it should always produce the same results, but that could just be a mathematical limit. Uh, you can construct example data sets, even small data sets with like maybe two features that uh, give you different orderings. We can take that offline. You should try try it out, and uh, we'll we'll talk about. It. Did you have a question? Okay. Yes. So today you fire each variant on your training data and then see what tree trains the best on the data that you're given. You won't know anything about new data, but today you do the tree that works best for um I would not recommend that. So the, the question was uh so oh wait, so there's a question on Zoom can uh, can I address this uh, briefly? Because uh, I, I want to make sure that this uh, this is about something before. The question is, can you repeat the minimum in the majority error? Uh, in the majority, I'm assuming that that's about the definition of majority error. Uh, about this min of p comma one minus p. The way to think about it is, imagine that you have p feature, p fraction of the examples are plus and one minus p, p fraction of the examples are label minus. The majority error is obtained by picking the most frequent label. The most frequent label. If the most frequent label is plus, so let's uh, 
uh, there's too much to write and I don't have space. So if the most frequent label is a plus, then on P fraction of them, the choice is correct. And on one minus P of them, it's incorrect. So the, the more common one of them is not the one that is the, the where, you, uh, where you accumulate an error. If the most common label is a plus, the amount of error is one minus P. If the most common error is a minus, the amount of error is the fraction of examples that are plus, namely P. So the majority error is going to be the minimum, the lower of P and one minus P. I think I probably said that in the worst possible way. So I'm fairly certain I confused you more than I uh, explained it. Are there questions about that before? Yes. In case of the gene index, if there are... No, wait, wait, one minute. Are there questions about majority error? <laughs> Sorry. Did that answer your question on Zoom? If you have more than two cases, the Gini index is going to be the sum of the squares of all their probabilities. Now let's go to your question. The question was, so you have these three possible choices of, inf uh, of defined, three possible ways to define information gain. If you plug in entropy in the definition of the information gain, you get the information gain as defined by Quinlan. If you plug in Gini index or majority error, you get other functions that are like information gain. The suggestion was, I can train trees with all three of them on my training data, test it on my test set, pick the one that is the lowest. And that's the one that I'm going to uh, advertise as the tree that I have. That's a dangerous thing to do because your test set might accidentally confuse you, confuse your procedure. The right thing to do is actually what is there in your homework, cross-validation. Uh, cross-validation is perhaps what, maybe uh, very expensive, but definitely the right way to choose these, make these sort of choices that dictate how your learning algorithm operates. These choices that dictate how your learning algorithm operates are called hyperparameters. And these hyperparameters, to choose them, you partition the data into five, a, few, a bunch of, uh, let's, uh, let, let me draw this here. So imagine that you have a data set. Every column here is an example, let's say. What you do is you partition the data. In this case, I just picked four. Uh, Four is usually not the uh, thing. People use five, so let's make five. Uh, the whole thing is my training data. Completely out, out, outside this set is a held out test set. So I partition the data into five folds. Each of them is called a fold. And you train your, let's say you're evaluating your hyperparameter um, namely the choice of this information, uh, the, the disorder attribute. You make a choice. Let's say you choose majority error. You train your tree on four of them. So you train your tree on one, two, three, and four, and you evaluate it. This is not seen at all. And you evaluate it on five. And then you do the same thing for one, two, three, five, and you evaluate on four. One, two, four, five, evaluate it on three. And and you get five different evaluations. And you take the average, average accuracy. And this is a measure of goodness of your choice. You do this for each of those things. You get three average, these are called cross-validation accuracies. So this set here, inside this bit here, this is called validation. Uh, the validation set, you have, you try out all possible validation sets, you get a cross-validation, average cross-validation accuracy. You measure the average cross-validation accuracy for each hyperparameter choice. In this case, you have three. You choose the best one. Let's say the Gini index tree is, the, let's say the choice of Gini index is the best. Then what you do, is you go back to your entire training data and you train a tree on the entire training. 
And then you finally test it on the test set once. Because the test set is your uh, sort of simulation of the future. You never use future data to make a choice of what which learning algorithm is best. Because in real life, you don't have access to that. Does that? Yeah. And this is essentially what you're doing in your homework as well. You'll be implementing this in your homework, and uh, we've already partitioned the data for you for the homework into five pieces. Uh, this is called five-fold cross-validation. Uh, you can use ten-fold cross-validation. You can do there are slight other versions of, and uh, you might say that this is very tedious and mm -hmm. this is like a lot of for loops and kind of irritating code to write. The bad news is uh, it is tedious. The good news is you'll be doing this for all your homeworks. Um, uh, somehow that was a, that in my head that felt like a positive. So let me say that in a positive way. Any code that you write now, the same template is going to be useful for a future homework. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have these different variants of information gain, and uh, each of these work like entropy. You can replace entropy with other things um, in the in your uh, uh, implementation. And you know, if you want to play with this, I encourage you to kind of uh, in your code playing play, playing with these. Uh, uh, different variants. The other um, uh, thing to think about is what do you do when you have missing feature values? So imagine that you have this data set here. Uh, you have these five examples, and one value is missing. The I mean, you 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 could ask why is that value missing? Maybe the humidity sensor broke on the eighth day, and so you couldn't record that feature, or maybe uh, that data was. Uh, was scanned from a printed sheet um, and the OCR stopped working on that particular cell and somebody tossed away the paper before you could fix it. You know, features go missing for all sorts of reasons. So how do you handle this? Any ideas? Yes. You could choose the most common value. What would you choose here in this case? So high. Maybe. You would choose the value high and because mm -hmm. It's the most common in this column among the others. Something else that you can do? Any other ideas? That's one approach. Yeah. Uh, I would choose the most common, uh, 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 most common attribute value that that uh, that has other attribute values in the same. Thing. What do you mean by that? Uh, like uh, I will find uh, other examples that has outlook sunny, temperature mild, and wind weak. Oh, I see. And take the minority vote. Oh, there's not, but there's nothing of that sort here. It's possible that you, this is you don't get that anywhere else. Yes. So you kind of accomplish that same thing. You can just add each uh, recursive step to place it with the most, so that you don't replace it in advance and then run the whole thing. Good point. So you, you leave it blank. You leave it blank, and you do this. Make this choice of. High, you make this choice of high only inside the recursive step so that you are inside a subset of examples where all the features that came at the top were the same value. Other options, other ideas. Yes. You could, you could toss out that row saying that, yeah, that row is incomplete, so I'm not going to use it, but uh, usually that's not done. Because collecting data can be expensive. You know, this is just you know, something goofy about playing test. Imagine instead that every row corresponds to um, the decision about some healthcare uh, data point. A single row might actually be in, very informative. A single row might have cost a lot of money to get. Maybe you're paying a radiologist some money to decide something about an X-ray. So it's, you can choose to toss out data point if your source of data is so large that it doesn't matter. But sometimes you may not have the plug. Yes. You can guess. How do you guess? One guess here is the value high. Are there other guesses? Okay. Why would you choose that? Yes. You just toss a coin. Basically, just like a random guess. You could do that, but you could do slightly better than random. I would argue that already choosing the most common thing is slightly better than random. 
Last one. Yes. The most common attribute value with the same label. Why is that a reasonable thing to do? That's an interesting point. So you could use the most common feature value among other examples where the label is the same. So rather than looking at all examples and deciding whether it's high or low, you look at all the examples where the label is no, all the other examples where the label is no, and choose the most common values. And this is also, it's completely fair because at training time, you have access to the labels. We're talking about uh, training time here, right? There's one more option, which, uh, yeah. Treat unknown as its own category. You can treat unknown as its own category, except that uh, the semantics of unknown becomes a little bit vague there because unknown humidity may occur only once. At that point, you're treating it as a, as something that is different from high and normal. So it's it's it, it's done. This is done, but depending on how uh, what that uh, the the feature is, this could lead to undesirable outcomes. Okay. There's another option here, which is uh, you can also use fractional counts. Who said that humidity should be only uh, high or low? What if humidity, in this case, was three-fourths high and one-fourth low? So when I'm going to replace this with one high and zero low, or zero normal. Clearly, this data was not collected in volatility. Humidity only has high and low value, normal values. There is no low. So in this case, the suggestion is, I look at the remaining examples I have, and I see that three out of four are high, and one out of four is low. So I'm going to give it a fractional feature. So three-fourths high and one-fourth low. And I'm not going to give you the details of how to use this for calculating entropy. But you can essentially use these fractional counts in, in a very natural way inside your entropy calculator. I'm going to leave it as an exercise. Think about it. So think about whether this will change probability computations and as a result, the entropy and the information gain and all those things. Yes. Did you just create a new column in the previous slide? We did not create a new column. We essentially said, this column here is a. Uh, uh, I mean, did we split the uh, humidity power into high and low? You could have done that. If that that's one way of thinking about it. Yes. Basically, that's one way of thinking about it. But now you have real value features. We assume that uh, we have a complete set of all values, features, take, and all labels up front. Um, this is something that we need to know for decision tree. In fact, for any learning algorithm, we need to at least know what the label space is up front. Um, yes. So just confirm, was that a fraction of all the points in the data or the subset? Either one's doable. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is during training time. I'm leaving this as an exercise. Uh, if you want, we can uh, talk about this uh, offline. Oh, there's a question. In would our choice for how to fill the missing values be a hyperparameter, you, you could treat it as a hyperparameter. Typically, people don't treat it as a hyperparameter because if you're starting to do cross-validation over every possible decision you need to make, um, we will not have enough compute. So these kinds of choices tend to be made upfront um, without too much thought or with, you know, okay, that didn't sound right. Uh, these kind of these kinds of choices tend to be made upfront, and you just stick with them. And frankly speaking, these different choices don't make that huge of a difference. They could, but somehow you don't seem. I have never seen these uh, choices as hyperparameters. As we will, as our learning uh, setups get more and more complicated, we will find we'll see that the number of hyperparameters grows very very large. And so we can't be doing cross-validation over all of them. So we end up making choices for some of them based on intuition uh, about what we know about the domain or what we know about the problem. It could actually be treated as a sort of pre-processing, actually. Yes. Uh, 
um, well, if you're missing a label, then you're you do you can't do that because uh, the label is the thing we care about. Um, if you if you have any rule that allows you to guess the missing label, then you already have the classifier. And that's what we are trying to discover through this whole process. Um, what's a hyperparameter? A hyperparameter is any choice that dictates how your learning algorithm will execute, any choice that dictates what your hypothesis space is going to be. But it, it does not, importantly, it is not the result, it's not going to be the result of the learning algorithm. So what if you have like two missing values in that column? Would you only use the original data in the long still for assigning the fractional value? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of this is, yes. Yes. We'll have many more of them. So can you explain what that is for position? You could. Um, you could. You could. Uh, essentially, you're doing missing value imputation in the traditional sort of linear algebra way. And you can do that. The only sort of uh, technicality you'll have to figure out somehow is these are discrete features. So we want discrete, you know, you are, you are, the, the values are things like hot, cold, and mild. SVD deals with real numbers. You need to do some transformations that you have to decide. Last question, yes. For a we are losing a stop loss, for example, like one of the sunnies, we just say, hey, everything else is sunny. This is for sunny. So yep. we just say this is sunny. That's literally what the first strategy is, using the most common value of the attribute in the data. Oh. The second one is using the most common value value of attributes in uh, the data, provided the label is the same. And the third one is this fractional thing, which is slightly more complicated. It uh, it's if the last thing does not make sense, you can ignore it. It's uh, it's a little more complicated. It leads to interesting other uh, points, but not necessarily directly relevant. But all of this is during training time. What do you do a new when if a new test example comes in and a certain feature is missing? Let's say your what happens if a feature is missing during test time? Let's say the root of your tree is Outlook. And somehow that feature is missing in your test example. What can you do now? The first question that comes, the decision tree is like a, a set of questions, right? The first question is, what's the value of outlook? Where? Where? In which set of examples? That's really what you can do. The most common, wait, the most common label or the most common feature value? Feature value. That's the better thing to do. Essentially, you can adapt the same ideas into to work at the test time also. Essentially, whatever method you use during training time, you remember. For Outlook, the most common label was uh, whatever, sunny. At test time, if the uh, uh, Outlook feature is missing, you just use the value sunny. Um, or whatever method you use, you essentially just remember those decisions and you apply them at test time. Yeah. Well, performance works if you use like different samples. Yes. Yeah, quite likely. Yeah. Okay. So this is the uh, there's one more sort of an easy discussion point, which is about features that are not Boolean. We've already seen this. You know, uh, the features don't have to be Boolean. If they are, if they take three values, your node from the tree will have three edges coming out of it. If they take fourteen values, your node will have fourteen edges coming out. The only sort of a, uh, uh, there's, there's, you know, there are papers and there are actually uh, software packages that try to force everything to be a Boolean by converting even these sort of multi-valued features into Boolean. So Outlook is sunny. The feature that says the value of Outlook equals sunny, it gets converted into three different features. Outlook sunny is true. Outlook overcast is false and Outlook rain is true is false. So you get three columns instead of one. And basically that means that the entire data becomes Boolean. There are, uh, the advantage of doing that is you can do some post-processing and you can convert your tree into rules that uh, uh, 
that lead to other sort of ways to represent your trees. It doesn't really change any of your uh, uh, the mechanics of the algorithm. The more interesting question is, what do you do with numeric features? We've already encountered this. If your features are real valued, you bucket them, you threshold them or, uh, uh, or convert them into ranges to basically get back discrete categories. We've seen this before, so I'm not gonna dwell on this point. The reason I don't wanna dwell on it is because I wanna spend some time talking about overfitting. Um, overfitting is uh, uh, a, a, an important concept that shows up across machine learning. Uh, I'm introducing it here because this is the first learning algorithm and the first hypothesis phase we are discussing in this class. Uh, it, it, it's, a point, it's a concept that applies to every single learning algorithm we'll encounter, every single hypothesis phase we'll encounter. Let me give you an example to illustrate this point. Imagine this function that I'm calling the first bit function. It's a Boolean function that takes uh, n features and produces uh, a, a single uh, Boolean as uh, an output. And the way this function works, and I'm basically revealing the mind of nature here, or the oracle function. The oracle function, what it does is it takes the entire input, as many features as they have, and the output is simply the first feature. It copies over the first feature as the label. All the other features are irrelevant. So it's basically the first uh, bit function, as the name suggests. So it's the function that where the output is the first bit. It's very easy to draw the decision tree for this function. What would the decision tree for this function be? Just, just x0. zero. So if uh, x0 is true, then the label is true. If the x0 is if x0 is false, then the label is false. Right? Now here's a nice sort of sanity check for your code that you write for your homework. Um, it should produce that decision tree uh, for this data. So uh, for any sort of uh, learning algorithms that you implement throughout the semester, use tiny data sets where you know what the, the actual behavior should be to debug your code. Don't use the given data set to debug your code because uh, that's that's not a very that's that's a road for a lot of pain. Um, use controlled data sets where you where it's tiny. You can actually step through the decisions that are being made. In fact, for this particular thing, I would encourage you know just to manually verify that IDP actually picks x zero over x one uh, with the information gain criteria. In any case, so we have this function. This is an easy function. Um, now, if you have two features, this table will have at most four rows, right? Because you have two power twos, you have two combinations of uh, uh, two, two values. If you have n features, you'll have two power n possible rows in the truth table. Now, imagine that you have all you your you have a training set consisting of these two power n rows, and you train a decision tree. What will the error be when this particular tree is tested on future examples? Someone was not answered. No, no. I said someone was not answered. Yes. There shouldn't be any error. Why? Oh, the, so the answer is the training data is uh, the, the, the training data was created with a simple rule and we know we have the exact function you can't have any error. in fact there's a little bit there's a uh, the, basically you're right but this I, I would go further the, uh, the did you have a question I have a comment about Oh, I, I, I'm going to answer that anyway. So the thing is, the, remember the ID3 algorithm will keep partitioning the data till it gets every label right, every every training example correct. You will keep if in in a certain subset, you know, you have, you've come down the tree, you know, you've been building a tree, and then somewhere here there are only two examples. Well, uh, there are two examples, and one of them has a label plus, and one of them has a label minus. You still have some features left. You're going to split the data again. 
The ID3 algorithm will keep splitting the data till we come to a leaf node where all the examples have the same label. What that means is the ID3 algorithm will produce decision trees that are perfectly consistent with any training set, provided there's no noise in the data. That's, an, that's the first point. The ID3 algorithm always produces a consistent uh, decision tree. And second, if you have n features, there are only two power n possible examples. That means the ID3 algorithm will produce a tree that is consistent with all two power n possible rows. There exists no future example. There is if any future example has to be one of those two power n things. The ID3 algorithm is consistent with it, which means it's never going to have any, it's never going to see any example that it has not already seen. The decision tree is not going to going to see any example that ID3 is not seen, which means it's going to get the label right. The training error in this case is the training error of the ID3 algorithm is going to be zero. And because the training data is complete, the test error is also going to be zero. Generalization is going to be perfect. There's no generalization is trivially perfect here. Yes. When the training data is complete, how are you going to tell the well, I mean, I can always simulate this process that keeps harvesting, that creates, picks one of the rows from the table and evaluates on that. We have all the possible combinations. Yes. So there is no notion of an unseen future example. All future examples are going to be seen. But that's not the, yes, there's a question. Is there, a, there shouldn't be any error because you can, oh, sorry. What if you pick your features? Oh, so if you pick, uh, so the question is, the, the, uh, but you can always pick your features incorrectly. And here I'm assuming there's no noise. If there's no noise, if there's no noise, there's going to be zero training. The reason I assume there's no noise is because that's the next thing I'm going to, that's the assumption I'm going to drop now. Let's say that uh, the data is noisy. And in fact, I'm going to introduce a very specific kind of a noise. Imagine that you have two power n examples, the entire truth table. In this case, you have three features, you have two power three, eight rows. And the training and the test data is corrupted randomly in a specific way. A feature, uh, the label is uh, randomly uh, changed with some probability. So here we have a training set consisted, consisting of these eight examples where the, the label here is true and the label here is false and the training and the test examples are uh, 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 are subject to different random noise meaning they are independently corrupted does the setting make sense okay uh, it does, so what would happen to this generalization error what would happen to the test error if you grow a tree on this data would you still have zero error in this on future example no. And a uh, lot of head shaking. Would you have zero error? No. no. Someone says yes. I heard a yes. Yes, why? Yes, because the result will not change the, the, the fraction of these people. So the, the answer for the reasoning for yes is the doesn't matter if there is noise, the true function is not changed. However, we never see the true function. We only see future examples that may also be corrupted. So our tree, we, we may construct a tree and a new example comes in. Even if we have the perfect tree, a new example might be corrupted. And we can only measure error with respect to data that we have, not with respect to the true function. And with respect to the data we have, it may seem like we have an error. So if we evaluate our model, the tree that we train on any subset of data that we can construct that has been corrupted in this way, our tree that we grow will not agree with, may not agree with the label on that randomly corrupted example. And that's all we can measure. We never have access to the true trees. So, and practice, is it possible that the two data points that's the same feature, but have different data. In practice, it's possible. It's entirely possible because of noise. That's that's that that could happen. 
In fact, uh, in this particular case, um, so I, I did this experiment where I trained trees of uh, with different number of features. I, in all cases, only one of those features is relevant. And you'll find that uh, the, uh, the test error essentially converges to 0.375. There's a neat sort of a, you can, I need not have done this. You could have derived this uh, um, analytically and I'm not gonna go into the detail. The important point is that the, gen, the test error is no longer zero, but that's fine. What would the training error, what would the error or the training accuracy, what would the accuracy on the training data be for this setting? Yes. It would still be zero because we're forcing the tree to always perfectly align with the training data. That's right. It doesn't matter if the generalization error is low, the training error is still zero, but the training accuracy is still 100%. Why? Because the ID3 algorithm does not know about the true function. All it knows is about the data that you give it. And the ID3 algorithm will is forced to fit the data that's given to it, which means that it's going to get perfect accuracy on the noisy data that we have. Yes. If you have no experience, you have like say two duplicate rows, but one of the labels gets corrupted. So then how do you classify that? Perfectly. Sure, I, I, I have a very specific definition of noise here, okay. where all two power n rows are available, no row is duplicated, and the la label is uh, randomly flipped okay. with some probability. So even though the training error, <laughs> what happened there? So even though the training error is uh, zero, which may lead us into thinking we have a perfect uh, decision tree, the generalization error is going to be non-zero because our learning algorithm is doing a little too much to remember the noise in the data. Even though there's noise in the data, there's nothing in the learning algorithm that says, hey, this example is noisy, let me talk it out. It's going to make an effort to remember that also. So the, this is the problem. The decision tree learner will find a tree that agrees with the data. The data consists both of signal and noise, and the decision tree will fit the noise. So then why is the classifier not perfect? It got zero training error. Why is it not perfect? We, find the wrong function. Yeah. we found the wrong function. Because we found the the real function was uh, the first bit function, but by fitting the noise, we ended up with a different function that's not that, which is going to disagree with the first bit function uh, in future examples and even noisy examples. We say that this classifier that we train has ended up overfitting the training data. Overfitting. Uh, uh, it happens when a learning algorithm finds a hypothesis that fits the noise in the data because of uh, uh, randomness, effects of randomness, because of irrelevant features, uh, and all of these can uh, impact the, our choice of hypothesis. And this can lead to poor performance on future examples. I'm going to stop here, and uh, on Thursday, I'm going to give a formal definition of overfitting, and then we we'll move to linear class, linear models. Uh, we have office hours today. In my, we can move, go to my office, and we, if you have any questions, we can talk about that. Don't forget your homework, please.